JAXA is one of the biggest and most advanced space agencies in the world, yet the general public usually pays little attention to JAXA. The US is known for being the most advanced. The Russians are known for being insanely reliable. The Chinese are known for prioritizing progress over everything. And the Indians are known for being extremely cost effective. But Japan, similar to the Europeans, isn't really known for any one particular aspect. Don't let that fool you though. While JAXA may not be the most interesting for news outlets, JAXA is one of the most interesting for scientists. So here's the story of JAXA and why they're so underrated today. Taking a look back, it all started in the 1950s shortly after World War II. Japan had not only lost World War II, but they were devastated by the US bombing that closed out the war. To make things even worse for Japan, the US and its allies were occupying Japan after the war and they were keeping Japan on a very short leash. Japan was not allowed to have an army, and they weren't technically supposed to be developing space technology for military use. But as the Soviet Union rose in power, the Allies more or less forgot about Japan and just let them do whatever they wanted by the 1970s. When the first parts of JAXA were founded in the 1950s though, they were walking a pretty thin line. So it makes sense that the core of JAXA was founded under the premise of educational research. In April of 1955, the University of Tokyo launched the pencil rocket horizontally, and this launch marked the beginning of the Institute of Space and Astronautical Science or ISAS. Later that year, in August, the Akita Rocket Testing Center would be established at Michikawa Beach. This center would serve as their hub for testing over the next several years. At first, they would experiment with the pencil and the baby rocket, but soon enough, they would move on to their first major project, the Kappa rocket. Japan had a reasonable goal of reaching 60 to 100 kilometers with Kappa, but even that would prove quite difficult at first. For a full year, the Japanese would try using a composite propellant with Kappa, and the rocket would explode on ignition every single time. It wasn't until they switched propellant that they would achieve their first successful launch with K6 in June of 1958. Following the success, ISAS would create a much larger version of the K6 called the K8. In July of 1960, the K-8 would successfully be launched to an altitude of 190 kilometers, which gave Japan the title of making the first ion density measurement. Though the Allies heavily limited Japan's space projects, this limitation was also partially a positive. While the US and Russia were racing towards putting animals and people into space, Japan was able to solely focus on scientific missions. This would be one of their primary reasons for Japan's edge in space robotics and research. Anyway, getting back to the Kappa rocket, ISAS would continue improving their rocket and reach higher and higher altitudes. In December of 1961, they would launch a K9 to 300 kilometers and successfully measure the electron density and temperature at that altitude. Unfortunately, the Akita Testing Center would be closed up in 1962, but the Noshiro Testing Center would be opened up soon after. As ISAS transitioned to a new testing center, they would also transition to two new rockets called the Mu rockets and the Lambda rockets. In July of 1964, ISAS would launch the Lambda L31 to an altitude of 1,000 kilometers. To put that into perspective, the ISS orbits at 408 kilometers. That same year, ISAS would also launch the MT-135-1, which was Japan's first weather observation satellite. Over the next several years, ISAS would continue pushing the boundaries with Mu and Lambda. In 1967, for instance, the Lambda L3H3 would reach 2,150 kilometers. Though ISAS was making rapid progress with the two rockets, ISAS would find it quite difficult to put an artificial satellite into orbit. On the first try, the mission would fail due to improper stage separation. On the second try, the final stage would fail to ignite. On the third try, the third stage would fail to ignite. On the fourth try, the third stage would collide with the upper stage. It wasn't until the fifth try in 1970 with the L4S5 that Japan would finally put the satellite Osumi into orbit and become the fourth country to do so. As we all know, the US put humans on the moon just one year before that in 1969, and that success would motivate them to loosen the restrictions on Japan. Japan would instantly create their own national space agency, called the National Space Development Agency of Japan or NASDA, on October 1st, 1969. Unlike ISAS, which was solely focused on scientific missions, NASDA was focused on launch capability. So at this point, Japan had two significant space agencies with vastly different goals. Aside from loosening restrictions, the US would hand over unclassified rocket designs to Japan. This gave Japan a major boost in terms of spaceflight development, but at the same time, it also hindered Japan from developing their own designs earlier. 
a year after NASA was founded, they would start work on the N-1 launch vehicle. The N-1 was based on the American Thor Delta rocket and was capable of putting 1,200 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The first N-1 would be launched in September of 1975, and the Japanese would complete a total of seven different launches over the next several years. Fun fact, the second launch of the N-1 would take place on February 29th, 1976, which is the only orbital launch conducted on a leap day. Around the same time, NASA started development of the N-2 rocket in October of 1976, which allowed them to transition to the N-2 as the N-1 was retired. Similar to the N-1, the N-2 was based on the American Delta rocket and had a payload capacity of 2,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. NASA completed the first N-2 launch in February of 1981. They would complete another seven launches by the end of 1987, and all eight launches would be fully successful. In the meantime, NASA started development of the H-1 rocket, and this is when NASA would take their first steps away from American rockets. The first stage of the H-1 would be modeled off of American rockets. However, all of the upper stages would be designed by the Japanese. The H-1 had a payload capacity of 3,200 kilograms to low Earth orbit and would complete its first launch in August of 1986. The H-1 would complete a total of nine launches by 1993, all of which were successful. NASA would also work with NASA and score a couple of seats on the space shuttle. As a result, NASA would be able to select three Japanese astronauts in 1985, and Mori Mamoru would become the first Japanese astronaut traveling to space aboard the space shuttle in 1992. Anyway, given the success of the H-1, NASA would quickly turn around and start development of the H-2, which would be fully designed by the Japanese. The H-2 used the same upper stages as the H-1, and NASA simply designed their own first stage to make the rocket fully Japanese. NASA didn't just change the nationality of the rocket though, they would also make it much more powerful than the H-1. The H-2 had a sizable payload capacity of 10,060 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and it cost $90 million per launch. To put that into perspective, the Falcon 9 has a payload capacity of 22,800 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and cost $62 million new. So, the H-2 was about 3.3 times as expensive as the new Falcon 9. But, it was 20 years ahead of Falcon 9, so not bad at all. The H-2 would end up completing seven launches by the end of the 1990s, five of which were fully successful. As NASA worked on improving their launch capability, ISAS was still chugging along with their Greek rockets. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, ISAS would continue launching their MU rockets filled with experiments and data-collecting satellites. They collected critical data on the sun, the environment, and various asteroids. As NASA progressed though, ISAS quickly faded into the background. We didn't see any new rockets or anything particularly exciting. Don't get me wrong here, ISAS was still gathering extremely important data. But given the dense technical nature of their experiments and data, there's not too much to discuss. Moving into the new century, Japan would decide that it was inefficient to operate multiple space agencies separately. As a result, in 2003, they would choose to combine the three biggest space agencies in Japan, which were NASDA, ISAS, and the National Aerospace Laboratory. NASDA brought advanced launch technology, ISAS brought expertise in space research, and the National Aerospace Laboratory, or NAL, well, they were there too. NAL had actually been around since 1955 and specialized in aircraft and rocket research, but they didn't actually build anything. At one point, they tried to make a space plane called the Hope X, but that didn't quite pan out. So, the superstars in the collaboration were definitely NASDA and ISAS. And with that, JAXA was created and Japan became one of the strongest space powers in the world. Since then, JAXA has completed a countless number of exploration and research missions, so we're going to have to speed run through these. Starting with lunar and interplanetary missions, we have Hayabusa. Hayabusa was a mission to a nearby asteroid called 25143 Irakawa. The spacecraft was launched in May of 2003, it reached the asteroid in November of 2005, and it brought back samples in June of 2010. Next up, JAXA launched their lunar orbiter, Kaguya, in September of 2007. This was the most significant lunar mission since the Apollo program. In December of 2010, Japan attempted to insert Akatsuki into orbit around Venus. Unfortunately, this mission would fail, but Japan would try again in 2015 and succeed. In August of 2004, JAXA deployed two solar sails at varying altitudes. In July of 2005, JAXA would launch an X-ray telescope in a mission called Suzaku. In January of 2006, JAXA would launch an advanced land observation satellite. In 2008, JAXA launched a greenhouse gas observing satellite. And in 2007, Japan delivered the Kibo space module to NASA, which is the largest single ISS module. 
That was just eight of Jax's most notable missions. They have dozens upon dozens more. Looking forward, Jax plans to play an integral role in Artemis, the Lunar Gateway, a lunar mission with India, and of course a plethora of research and experimental missions. As you can see, Jax has been one of the biggest background players in the space industry. But they are often overlooked by the media because they don't deal with human spaceflight. They don't do the exciting launches to the ISS or the moon. But their scientific contribution to the space industry are just as important. And who knows, maybe JAXA has something up their sleeve when it comes to human spaceflight. Do you think JAXA deserves more recognition? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you agree that JAXA is underrated. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.